Welcome everyone that's joining us today. We're gonna to give everyone a few minutes to join as we're starting live this webinar. Uh, my name is Marty Reed and I'm with Positive Coaching Alliance. I am the National Partnerships and Marketing Manager with PCA. Just wanna thank you all for joining us today. Uh, good morning to all the parents and coaches, administrators, PCA supporters, athletes, and gamers. We're glad that you can join us. And we're gonna give everyone a moment to join in here um, and wanted to introduce our panel as well. And we are on a mission at Positive Coaching Alliance to improve the culture of youth sports that ensures a positive social emotional development experience for all kids. We're so excited to have you here with us today for our exciting conversation all about esports and the gaming culture with our national partner Cloud9 and their training grounds program. Cloud9 is one of the most recognizable esports organizations in the world and we started working with Cloud9's training grounds program at the start of the year and it's their development program for youth and uh, I think this is the perfect Perfect partner to you know help us lead today's discussion on can esports teach life lessons and how so. Uh, so without further ado, I want to um, welcome our panel here. And as always, our conversations will be recorded and available for you to watch the recap and listen in after today as well. But feel free to drop your questions in the Q and A feature here, and we'll do our best to get to them. So thanks for joining us again. And let me introduce our panel and we'll get started. So we have Samir Bolar. He is Cloud9's moderator for today and the executive director at Trainer Training Grounds. We have Dr. Rachel Cohort. She's the research director of Take This, which is a mental health nonprofit de decreasing stigma and increasing support for mental health in games. We have Jarrell Batak. He's the director at Scholastic Fellow Program, NASEF, which provides a professional learning community for educators interested in connecting esports into schools and um, after school programs. We have Sue Thoughts. She's the senior program manager at Common Sense Education, which is providing digital citizenship curriculum. And also, she's the co founder of Equity in Action California. And we also have Larry Milges. He is a parent advocate of Cloud9 and Training Grounds. He has multiple kids and um, a coach going through the Training Grounds program as well. So I'm really excited to have this amazing panel here today. I'd love Samir to just kick us off and explain to our listeners and everyone tuning in why this conversation is important for parents and coaches and why we brought this specific group of panelists together here today. Thank you, Marty. Uh, appreciate the opportunity um, to speak to all of you today. You know, I think you know this. This is a really relevant, timely um, conversation to be having. I think at the youth level, you know, esports isn't at a place where it's trying to legitimize itself as a sport. I mean, that would be a great conversation to have. I think in the minds of many parents and educators, esports is still trying to legitimize itself as a reasonable way for kids to spend their free time. <laughs> so that's like, you know. Where, where we're at in a lot of the conversations that I'm having with educators and schools and just looking at a lot of the curriculum and how it's been developed to date and the development programs that exist today. I mean, you can just look at the title of our webinar, Can Esports Teach Life Lessons? You know, For anyone who plays or works at esports, it's an obvious yes, um, but for a majority of parents, it's still unclear and, and it's valid. Um, and so I think this panel discussion is really for the educators and parents who have kids who love playing video games, but you're feeling conflicted on like not only how to embrace, but also cultivate their interest in gaming. And so the panel we've put together is meant to validate those tensions, but also dispel some of the stereotypes, but also have like a really asset-based conversation about the magic of youth esports. And I hope parents and educators and coaches walk away from our conversation um, embracing it for what it truly is um, with open arms. So with that, you know, excited to have this conversation and hear from our panelists today, and I'll let you um, kick off that talk. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that and really setting the tone here and setting that foundation. You know, there was a report um, by Common Sense Media in 2015 that uh, reported that kids between the ages of 18 spend six hours a day online and 50% of that time is spent on social media or playing video games. And that number has likely increased over the past year. As parents and coaches, what are your greatest concerns about your children's online activity? I wanna direct that towards um, Dr. Sue. 
Can everyone still hear me? I can hear you just fine. You froze for a second. And I do not have my PhD or my MD, sorry, sorry. but uh, that's really okay <laughs> by all means. Um, I just wanted to, I don't want to overstate my qualifications here. I, um, I'm, a, I'm a parent of 15 and 17 year old. And I also work with many parents and educators who are very concerned with the amount of screen time that their kids are experiencing. And as a parent, my, my biggest concerns have always been, whether it be in the online space or in real life. Um, I always tell my kids, my number one concern is your safety. My number two concern is your health. And my number three concern is your happiness, all in that order. And so, um, you know, for me as a parent, when I see my kids, in, especially during, you know, during this time of the pandemic, when they've increased their screen time so significantly, um, you know, I, of course, I always am concerned because I want to make sure that they have a healthy balance of all the things that they, you know, that they love to do, make sure that they are getting enough physical exercise and, and you know, and being able to, to you know, to not you know, um, be so involved in something that, that they forget about their, you know, their parents or, you know, their friends, of course. But at the same time, um, Common Sense also just came out the study last year about the ways in which 14 to 22 year olds are engaging during this time of the pandemic. And 53% of kids said that social media has been very important for staying connected with family and friends. And many said, you know, has just been important. And so with that, you know, I imagine social media, video games, both are able to continue to connect our kids in the time when they have been feeling incredibly isolated because it has also been a time of increased, um, you know, in terms about depression in our kids because of that isolation. So, you know, that is something that, you know, as long as my kids are engaging in healthy relationships, whether they be online, especially during this time, or in real life, you know, that's a main concern of men, you know, mood changes, you know, failing grades, lack of, you know, any kind of, you know, human interaction, like those are the things that I'm most concerned about, as well as, um, you know, the other thing that we said in the study was that kids are also being exposed to an increased amount of racist, sexist, homophobic language as a result of some of the screen time, if, you know, especially if they're in spaces, um, you know, that are unmoderated. And so, you know, that, that is one of my other main concerns is not just, you know, like, you know, what it is that they're doing online, but who they're doing it with. And so, you know, is, is there increased exposure for, for that kind of content, you know, when they are in these spaces, you know, that is my concern as a parent, because I want to make sure that my kids feel safe and that they're interacting with people that, that also make them feel good. And it's a positive place. So that's my two cents Absolutely. on that. Absolutely. Thank you, Sue, for sharing. And that you made an excellent point. I mean, even in traditional sports, you know, we know that athletes spend a ton of time on online, on Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, you name it, you know, and um, it, it's often a place where there's cyber, cyber bullying and unhealthy online content. So it's important that we are aware of what uh, to expect in these um, atmospheres and how we can combat that. Larry, do you have anything to add on some of your greatest concerns about you know, your children's online activity? Yeah, I think when you ask the question, the three things that popped to my head, Sue hit them all, right? Um, safety's primary concern as a parent, right? You want your kids to be safe. Um, health concerns, if they're sitting in front of a monitor all day, how do you deal with that? And then fun. And I think if you extend that or wrap it all up, it's just having some sort of safe, healthy, fun, stimulating environment that they can continual look, continually learn. And learn, I think the tie into PCA is learn those life lessons. And I think if you have uh, something like C9 or some sort of focus that is really focused on teaching them the life lessons within all of those, I think you're way ahead of the game and, and it does depart from the traditional sports and that you're not out on the field. But I know for us, all of my kids have done all kinds of sports, but when COVID hit, it, it was almost a necessity and drove them into looking for that basically fellowship with other other players. And so it just all kind of hit at, at the, at I mean, COVID was unfortunate, but this all hit at the right time for them. And C9 has been a great place for them. So, and I'm a huge advocate of PCA. So yeah, I think it's great. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Yes, on, we, we are all online. You know, kids are online. It's a place that they're going to be. So we have to make sure that we keep it safe. Um, Dr. Coward, can you or, uh, share some thoughts on, you know, what are some quick must-dos for parents when it comes to keeping their child safe 
online while playing video games or engaging in, you know, online communities with strangers or people they haven't met. Yeah. Stranger danger is my number one fear. My child, I have a, I have a six-year-old and she plays Minecraft and it's always stranger danger. I'm just so it's the internet. <laughs> you have to be careful. Right. So my top three for parents, I always say are be intentional, be present and have fun. So be intentional with the content you're bringing into the house. A lot of parental concerns beyond stranger danger is about content of, of games and being age appropriate. So I always tell parents to be mindful and aware of the content that's being consumed. And you can do that by being present, uh, either playing with them, listening to who they're, they're playing with, asking them, hey, who are you playing with? Or whether it's having the audio of the, of the co-players come through the speakers in a public place in the house. Uh, a way that you can keep one ear, like some tabs on what your children are doing, even as they get older. I know that teenagers are less keen maybe on parents listening to their conversations, but it's always good to keep one ear on what's going on uh, and have fun. Games are supposed to be fun. And of course, we want to have parameters around that. Again, it is the internet and we need to be aware of who our children are engaging with. But at the end of the day, esports, games, they're fun things to do for our kids. I've argued they're the saving grace of COVID-19. They were the last playful, social, interactive space that our children have. Um, so it doesn't need to be this kind of black box, scary thing. Uh, it's meant to be fun. Jump in there, play a round of Fortnite, it's okay if you're not good at it, but at least you're engaging with it with your kids and getting a sense of what they're playing with. I love that. I love that tangible advice. There's anyone else have anything to add? Quick, you know, tidbits that parents can do. Um, I, I will say that that's what we do at Common Sense is we try to preview all the content for parents without you having to go and check out every nook and cranny of every game or watch the whole movie or read the whole book, you as a parent can go on and see what kind of content is involved. What are the positive role models? What is the language? What is the representation in each of these games? You know, do you have, you know, folks of color that are being represented in this game? Do you have, you know, strong female role models in this game, right? Can you, you know, look at it as a parent before you hand it over to your kid? And so, you know, my kids have always known that before I buy them something or okay something, they have to go and look it up and they sometimes have to make an argument on whether, and, and of course, you know, there's always good content in, in our, um, in our review about whether it's, a, you know, you're going to learn something as well. And so that's the point that they always try to argue is this is a game that's going to teach me some great strategy, or I'm really going to learn these great skills. So, um, so I, yeah, that, that's what we do all the time. Great advice. Great advice. I love how you even shared about representation, seeing, you know, what's in the games um, beforehand. Very, very great advice. And I hope parents are taking notes as they're tuning in. Samir, I'm going to pass it over to you to ask some more questions. Great. Um, so, you know, we wanted to start, if you're, if you're joining us late, you kind of heard some of these um, talking points around online safety. We wanted to intentionally start there just because it would be disingenuous not to acknowledge that like being online and engaging, you know, in forums with people you haven't met and playing games is just something that, you know, is super casual and you shouldn't worry about. Like there are real, you know, um, dangers and challenges and things that come up when you're online. And I think it's important to be eyes wide open about that and transparent and talk about it and not try to like sugarcoat it or, or kind of wash over it. And so I think it was important to start there. But um, as you know, Dr. Koa was getting into, there is just so much to love about the esports world um, and what a rich and incredible experience it is for kids. And so I really wanted to have that asset-based conversation around what esports truly offers for what it is, not for what it, you know, like a lot of the content that I see um, online, you know, I think a lot of, Educators want to make the case for like, oh, do esports because you can do coding or do esports because it's, you know, STEM education. And what I would say is like, if you want to do coding, there's some great coding classes out there. If you want to be an engineer, there's some great engineering class out there. But like, do esports because you love esports um, and then you want to learn about it. And so I, I really want to hear from, from our panelists, you know, what makes esports such a great communal online learning experience for kids that really contributes to their social emotional development? Like, why should we encourage parents to let their kids play video games? Because I think, you know, um, people might assume that it's a very isolating, introverted experience, but as most gamers know, it's one of the most social things you can do. But I wanna hear more tangibly and specifically about why you love it 
and where you've really seen it be an enriching experience for kids. And, you know, I haven't heard from Jarell yet, so would love yeah, to, to no, bring you I'd in here on to, this one. <laughs> love to jump in. This is the exciting part. I get really excited when I talk about all the opportunities. Um, you know, at, at NACEF, and I'll just clarify, NACEF is the North America Scholastic Esports Federation. Part of the model that we've created is really around this holistic approach to implementing esports within classroom, clubs, after school. Um, and it really is highlighting the various opportunities that go beyond the game. And I want to reiterate that point because, you know, when you think about esports, typically you think about the players, the games, but then when you actually look at the industry as a whole, there are multiple college and career pathways that go beyond just playing the games. That's things like, you know, content creation, things like, you know, looking at strategy or, or coaching, um, or even looking at the event management or business development side of things. And I think by highlighting those potential opportunities, it helps overall our community see that it's not just, you know, playing on a controller, sitting in front of a screen, that there are other opportunities that they can explore through that, right? And what I really love about this concept, about really this ecosystem approach to implementing Scholastic Esports programs, is it provides the opportunity to include more than just the typical, you know, gamer, right? They, you know, you may have some that are just interested in streaming shoutcasting and not actually playing the game. You may have some that are really passionate about organizing events and want to set up their own tournaments. Uh, you might even have someone that's really business savvy and actually wants to go on the whole track of strategically developing uh, a business out of their interests. So, and at NASEF, what we've done is really create, you know, multiple frameworks, curriculum, support structures to help move that forward. I mean, all of the curriculum we've created at NASEF is all California state approved. We have an ELA curriculum that's really great, um, CTE curriculum, and all of this is for free. Um, and so it really is showing that beyond the game, there are multiple college and career pathways uh, that students can explore. Great, thanks, Jarrell. Um, Larry, you know, tell me more about like just why you enjoy esports and where you've seen it really have um an enriching experience for your kids yeah so i have um three boys that are involved in esports right now I'll affectionately call them diesel animal and picklesworth and uh they all have different personalities diesel is more of our introvert animal and picklesworth are more of our extroverts and um they all have just found their niche or their their little community within the greater community and uh the ability for them to be able to just cross, you know, ages, sexes, so socioeconomic spheres, it's all in there and available for them to just meet new people. Uh, Picklesworth is, when he started playing Fortnite, he was 11 and he was playing with 22, 23 year olds and they had, you know, gamer friendships that were healthy gamer friendships for him to learn. And it's just, it's so neat to be able to have that access and it is almost 24 seven, which sometimes to my chagrin leads to later than normal bedtimes. But for the most part, just them being able to just meet and see them flourish, uh, especially due to the lockdowns and everything else, but just have the ability to just reach out and touch other people and develop those friendships and relationships. My son, Animal, is flying out to Florida to meet some friends that he met online. He actually left at noon today. So it's just been fantastic for them to be able to have access to that, that community. Great. You know, and Rachel, uh, we, we hear a lot about, you know, some of the critiques or stereotypes about online gaming communities. We term toxic come up, you know, in terms of how players engage. And so how do you think about some of these critiques and what are the ways in which you've seen esports effectively address um, some of the cultural critiques that have come with sort of the online gaming world and that whole community? Yeah, I, I, you touched one of the major stereotypes that it's antisocial, and that couldn't be right. further <laughs> from the truth. Um, as Larry was talking about, and Jarrell, you know, I like to talk about games being um, great spaces to foster relationships you wouldn't normally foster, as we talked about young with old, one side of the world interacting with another side of the world. When does an 11 year old get to guide a 22 year old through something challenging? And as Darrell was pointing out, think of the skills that that's fostering, you know, leadership skills or time management skills and different 
things that they wouldn't normally at that age have exposure to. And also, I like to always talk about how friendships are formed backwards in games. So you learn if you can trust them and then you get to know them. And it really emotionally jumpstarts these bonds. Like, are you going to help me win this match? Oh, you are? Okay, now I, I like you and I trust you. And now we can talk and we can get to know you. Where there's usually in the in the real world, I don't like that dichotomy, but you know what I mean. Um, it takes a long time to realize if you can if you can trust somebody. Um, that was a side tangent. About the toxicity, which I think we should mention because that is something that is not so much a stereotype. It's, it's a very real and valid concern. There is toxicity, there is misogyny and sexism in gaming cultures. Um, it's well known and well studied. It's not particularly unique to gaming cultures, but it is definitely a feature of gaming cultures. I think it's important for coaches and educators and parents to know that it exists so you can have the conversations um, and approach them before they happen. I'm sure that Sue probably has some great advice on this as well. Uh, if you're going to experience content in movies, for instance, that is maybe problematic, right? You want to have those conversations with your children before they watch it so they know what to expect and, and how to react. And the same is true with games. Are you going to experience cyberbullying? This is what it looks like. These are the steps you can take. You can tell your coach, you can tell your parent, you can report it to the game moderators, um, whatever those steps might be. I think it's really important that we're aware that it exists and we're aware of what to do so we can pass that information along. So it's not just blindsided like, oh, something weird's happening here and I don't know how to react to it. Great, thank you. Um, and you know that touches on a little bit about some of the pillars of the PCA framework. And so I wanted to, you know, get some good examples of how the principles of that framework play out in the esports world. Um, and before I do that, though, Sue, did you have something to add there? Uh, I, I just wanted to say that um, yeah, I am I am not um, immersed in this esports world like many of you, and and I'm not a gamer. I don't live and breathe this like you know like the rest of you. I come in as a total novice, and you know when you're talking about the joy that comes in with esports, or when you're talking about some of the culture or the stereotypes. That was totally me thinking, you know, oh, there's all this, you know, all these stereotypes and what kind of joy and culture could there be, right? That was my brain up until a couple of years ago when I saw, um, you know, some of the folks from, from NASEF and some of the folks from Riverside County here in Southern California who were talking about their esports program. And, you know, until I was able to hear the stories of the kids and the friendships and the relationships and understand that, yes, toxicity is present in, in some of this space, but also, these folks who are working with these students in, um, you know, through NASEF or, or through an academic program, it was very much, um, it was, it was, the, the culture was set, right? You set those expectations beforehand. You talk about these issues and you have a, a, a code of conduct that is expected of all students who are participating in this. And, uh, and then when I went to an esports tournament just to see what the heck this is all about, I was just blown away. I mean, I just walked around and I just asked kids, like, why are you here? Tell me what your experience is. Tell me what you like about this. You know, and I just heard kids telling me things like, this is where I made friends, right? Or, you know, I, I just, I mean, I was almost crying the whole entire day, just listening to these really amazing stories and watching the joy happen all day. And so this is coming from a person who has no, I've never played a video game for more than like five hours in my life, right? Like I am not a super fan. I am the skeptic coming in and I am the skeptical parent. So if I can see the joy and all of the positive culture that is built in that space, and I also work for a company that very much is very concerned about the effects of media and technology on kids. Like, you know, if I'm kind of a convert and I'm able to, to dip my toe in this water, then I feel like I should at least be out there, you know, talking to other parents and saying, you need to come in and check this out and see if those stereotypes bear out and see, you know, what the toxicity, you know, is in your esports club. Because I will guarantee you that if, you know, if it's worth anything, then they've already nixed that, right? They've already set those standards. They've already had that conversation. And not to sell, not to say that like, you know, it's never gonna happen, but just like within a school to say that we are preventing all cyberbullying incidents or all, you know, poor, poor decision-making, you know, that's not gonna happen. You're not gonna keep kids from being kids sometimes, but you are setting those expectations and you are having those conversations and you are, you know, getting prepared, right? It's all about prevention, I think. Thanks, Steve. Oh, thank you, Sue. I, I'm like so glad I kind of paused. I saw 
the thinking happening. And I was like, I got to go to Sue because she's about to drop a, a bomb right here. So thank you for, for that incredible insight. Um, and, you know, well said. You know, I think I want to really tie into the coaching piece of the esports world because that is a big part of why we are partnered with the Positive Coaching Alliance is that early on, we, we recognize that coaching is such an incredible um, ingredient in healthy esports and youth development. And we really invested a ton in really developing our coaches with the PCA model in mind. And, you know, what we've seen has been tremendous. I mean, we've seen, you know, um, coaches really help players think about the role that they're playing within the game and helping them find the right fit and seeing kids really just transform in their mindset when they're placed in the right role and feel like they're in a position to lead. We've had kids who've come in really introverted who wanted to develop in their team lead ability um, and they've been put in positions where they have to be shot callers and really question askers of the team to really incorporate um, drive like team communication and there's been teams that were basically silent while playing the game the entire time but after getting the coaching they needed um, the team just started communicating constantly throughout the game telling each other what's happening in the game who needs to be where what moves need to be made and you really see people come out of their shell and really that came from the coach really pushing the player out of their comfort zone and really focusing on their development. And so I would love to get a sense from all of you where you've seen examples of um, just great coaching have an impact on youth development in esports, whether that's through um, developing mastery in children, um, helping children understand like how to honor the game or how they fill their emotional tanks um, or really how to be in a development zone in the way that you play the game and how you coach the game. Um, so I'm curious, like, where you've seen the value of coaching um, play a role in youth development and some examples you've seen in terms of the impact that's had on young kids. And, you know, anyone can jump in. Um, I'll jump in real quick. Uh, all, all of them. But <laughs> really with games, I find it's about the persistence and then not giving up. You know, when you when you lose a match or when you make the wrong call or when you do something and it cascades across the whole team. Um, Esports coaches, and I, I've seen it happen just in real time to say, you can try again. That's the great thing about games. We just start over and we try again. And I know you can do that in all areas of life, but I think games really provide a unique ecosystem where you really feel that there's no real tangible benefits of failure, right? You can keep trying, you can keep getting better. And, there, and over time, you know, your team comes together. And I just, it's really magical to see. You're not going to lose the big football match and everyone is going to be very upset. You can just reset and you can try again. And, and it's resilience and persistence, I would say, are the key. Great. Hey. Yeah, I'm going to take, a, yeah, take a, a different approach to the question. So my secondary title is I'm an esports scholastic instructional coach, real fancy. Um, but the basic idea is that I get to work with these educators through the Scholastic Fellow Program, and we're actually entering our third year. We had uh, over 100 applicants. There's 30 now that we selected from 15 countries. Uh, really excited to work with them this year. And part of what I do with them is really kind of coach the coaches. Like their role is to create these programs. Um, and what I'm finding, especially looking through all of the amazing PCA materials, is that coaching in general is just it's it's something that we need for life. Like we, we have to have those advocates that are supporting us through these, you know, new spaces. And that's definitely what I've seen with a lot of these educators is, you know, in the same way that students are entering these spaces unfamiliar, you know, the teachers also need some guidance and support, you know, not just from myself, but also from their community and their admin, their stakeholders. Um, and through that process of growth, right, taking this really unique and innovative idea and implementing it in, you know, a very, you know, sad to say, Antiquate, antiquated, like, you know, educational system, they are changing the dynamics of the way students are learning within these spaces. And whether it's in the classroom, you know, outside of the classroom, I think really embedding those positive coaching values, both with the instructor as well as with the students, is really just going to help our community as a whole kind of embrace that support system, right? Embrace that forward thinking and, and movement into whatever it is that they're interested in, passionate about. Thanks, Terrell. Larry, you were a coach. You, I think you're probably a PCA coach too, right? What are some PCA, of your moves? Yeah, PCA certified <laughs> coach back in the day. Yeah, um, I 
from my boys' perspectives going through the camps, um, I think it's the relationship they develop with the good coaches. Um, as the coaches uh, show that they care and, and start to teach them all the different things, the elm, right, effort learning, um, mistakes, uh, and how to brush off the, the brush it off rituals, uh, just those applications uh, within the game do definitely transcend the game and work out in other things. And they uh, talk to their coaches all the time, the current ones and the ex coaches, and uh, they just get that support and that relationship and that having because sometimes kids don't listen to their parents. I'm going to, I'm going to spoil it for you, but uh, coaches can have a great impact on the kids and um, just that relationship and the support and using the, the PCA model. It just will definitely, I've seen it from coaching uh, younger kids 20 years ago. I, uh, I talked to some kids and they still remember how to brush it off or what our mistake ritual is. And so it's just, it, it's a, uh, awesome environment and I'm so happy for my kids to be in it and for other kids to be able to experience it as well. Can I yes, uh, ask, yeah, Larry, I, I'm fascinated by whatever the heck it is you're talking about, this brush it off mistake model, because I, I was just thinking about, we were talking about coaching. I was thinking about this kid that I was watching while I was at an esports tournament. He was very, he's like physically a very big kid. And, you know, um, I was talking to his coach and, I was, and um, he was saying how he has some attention and learning issues, you know, a lot of difficulty in school. And when he first started joining, you know, their, their esports club, he was, you know, he'd lose and he'd get super angry, right? Like he would, you know, he'd, uh, I'm sure you know many of these kids, right? Just very, you know, very angry, very explosive. And, he, um, you know, through his time with these these folks, you know, through these kids and through their coach, he has been able to really just, you know, just advance, right? And and become more socially and emotionally aware and understand his actions and, and what the impact is on the rest of his team. And I was watching him there. He wasn't even on the team, right? He's at this tournament. He was not even on the team. He's just there to cheer on all of his friends. Right. And he was not even participating, but just standing there and just cheering everybody on the whole time. And like that, to me, that's the success. That's what you want. You want this kid who's having a hard time in school and you want him to be included in the space and develop those social and emotional skills. So I don't know what the heck you're talking about when you're talking about this, this ritual. What does that mean? What is that? I can jump in a bit uh, to yeah. share a bit more about uh, the PCA principle of uh, helping bouncing back after mistakes. We call it mistake ritual. Something that you do physically to acknowledge, hey, I made a mistake. I'm okay. And I'm ready for the next play or the next skill, the next thing that we're, we're going to move past it and get through it. So we do believe that sports is the safest place for our kids to fail and learn how to bounce back after that failure. That's one of the biggest life lessons through sports. So we really want to help them develop a mistake ritual that they can do with their whole team. They can have an individual one or one that everyone buys in together. I love what you were sharing there, Larry, because, you know, you can be coaching a team where the chances are not every single athlete or participant on that team is going to have the same level of commitment. Maybe some are going to be more competitive or more, you know, committed than others. So as a coach, you have to understand how to connect with each athlete individually and understand that spectrum of commitment and competition. So does anyone have any advice on, you know, how to get a team working together? And another way we call it is filling the emotional tank, making sure that their tank is full and they're excited to be there and participate with each other. An example that you said, Sue, was clapping and cheering your teammates on. So that's one example. Can anyone share any more examples of how we fill the emotional tank through the gaming culture and e-sports? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that our, we have adopted and have our coaches do and model it for our players so that they do it amongst their team is the sort of five to one feedback um, model, right? And I think that's part of the emotional tank piece, which is you give five pieces of positive feedback before giving one piece of critical feedback. Um, because what we found is our teams were just kind of um, dogging on each other throughout the game and just kind of criticizing each other's play. And I mean, this is what you do in the forums when you're just kind of on your own without the structured environment, but through the coaching and support and modeling that feedback, giving it to the kids, they started giving it to each other, the positive praise, and then some of the constructive feedback. And we want that peer-to-peer -peer interaction to be more authentic and organic. Um, and we've seen them really take root um, with that, you know, and so that's just one example, I think, 
on the emotional tank piece that, you know, really caught on pretty easily with the kids. I think you brought up a really good point there about the adult in the room, right? The modeling piece. I feel like that's super important. You know, when you compare and contrast to the unregulated spaces of online gaming versus a moderated sort of safe and inclusive space that we're intentionally creating within either schools or after school programs, there's a very stark difference there. And with these sort of tools and that support structure, again, you're allowing, you know, these students to fail and learn how to implement you know these practices and that's different if we're just kind of like turning our heads and saying okay they're just gaming versus if we're integrating it and celebrating the learning that's happening uh you know within our own environments absolutely we want to see coaches model the type of behavior that they want to see more of if you see something positive you say something positive so we want that coaches parents to be involved in that experience absolutely Well, I can ask another question um, as we're getting into this conversation um, of, you know, supporting and cheering on our athletes and our children. What are some ways that parents can get more involved in supporting um, this growth and learning experience for their gamers? A lot of parents might not be as, you know, knowledgeable about the sports and the games that they're playing, but how can they still be involved and help support and cheer on their kids throughout this process and experience? I think a lot of times esports are seen as kind of a separate thing. Um, and for parents, a lot of parents, it could be easier to just reframe and think about it as any traditional sport. Ask how practice went. Ask how you like your teammates and how's it going with your coach. Like just reframe it. And I think it makes it a lot easier for a lot of parents to relate to it, even if they have no experience with esports. Excellent advice. That. Yeah, I think communication is definitely key. And um I think it, there's a twofold approach here. One is when you're playing your traditional athletics, you have a stadium and you have the stands and the fans will come in and they'll sit and the parents are always there together. Um, and so I think as esports develops, it would be good to develop, I don't know, your virtual stadium or even your discord area where parents can sit there maybe with the coach while they're playing the game and the coach can kind of enlighten them a little bit uh, talk them through um, the more that the parents can have access to it. So as that opens up, it's definitely going to create a um, space for um, parents to, to be more encouraging. Right. And so I know here when my kids are playing at diesel was a, a professional player for a while on game day, we would pull up the big screen and we'd make nachos and hot dogs to throw back to my baseball days. Right. <laughs> and we'd invite his friends and family over and we'd sit there and watch him on the big screen and just have a blast with that. But it, it is still a little bit more isolated in esports, and I'm hoping that over time it'll open up and, and parents can, when, when I coach, we do preseason parties, right. Where the parents would get to know each other and the kids. And I think you, you can still do that game nights where the whole team and the parents are there doing trivia questions about games or whatever, just, open it up so parents definitely need to have that communication and want to get involved and then as esports evolves and we get these things more open up it's, it's going to be great i love yeah. that i think yeah you definitely have to get creative with it you know um and and really think about like the native environment our players play in and how to interact with that as parents and, and be a part of that community and having your own community of sorts i mean i think the simple obvious one the way my dad would go in the backyard with me and toss the football, it's just play with your kids. You know, I think get on the platform, pick up the big controller and, and do some reps with your kid um, on the games that they love. Um, and, you know, I threw a very awkward, you know, I throw a very awkward football as an adult. So it's like, I'm totally ready to, to play you know, various titles in a very awkward way as well. Like that, that is consistent. The awkwardness that you feel in, 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 the, in the traditional and the esports world will be the same. Um, but I think that's kind of the, the most obvious one, but the one that can oftentimes bring the most connection. The awkwardness adds to the experience because I'm terrible at <laughs> Minecraft and my six-year-old loves that I'm terrible at Minecraft. I'm just gonna throw that out. <laughs> I was also going to say that um, the folks that are, you know, any of the coaches or any of the folks that are putting on the tournaments, I think part of it is making us as parents who have no idea what the heck is going on, making us feel welcome in that space, right? 
I'm not sure when I walk in, you know, where am I supposed to go? There's no traditional like bleachers. Where's the concession stand? Like, what are, you know, what the heck am I here for, right? Who am I watching? There's so much going on all at once. And these kids are over here yelling and, you know, like, what am, what am I supposed to do when I walk into that space? And what is, you know, what's the best thing that I could do to support my kid if I'm coming in there? And, you know, I, when I walked in, I'm the kind of person that's going to grab the kid next to me and, and say like, you know, what, what is going on here? Right? Like, explain this to me. Who's playing who? Like, I don't even see the kids. That's the thing. I don't know who's playing on this screen here. Right? So give me as a parent an entry point. So I know how to interact in this space and I, I feel invested and I know what's going on. I'll take it a step further as well. I mean, you know, again, going beyond the game, I think just having those conversations with your children, students, you know, what are their interests within the space? You know, it may be that they are really interested in even just the art piece of it and designing things. And that could be something that you spend time with them doing, right? Celebrating that, you know, you, you could take that. And, and I know that parents are very invested in their, you know, children's success in their careers and in their life. Like you can still do that with this. It's no different. You know, there's so many different areas that they can be interested in and just ask them and support that, you know, like if they want to draw, then draw some characters with them. If they, you know, want to shout cast, get on a camera and like record some videos with them, right? Like have some fun. And that's really the best way you can support is like everyone I think on this panel has said is just have fun. I love that. And as a, you know, parents that are tuning in here, you don't have to know, you don't have to be an expert at the games that your kids are playing. Your job as a parent is to really support them, making sure that they're having fun and being that caring adult that has their back, you know, even if they have a bad day, they have, or if they struggle out there, ask them about it, you know, ask them what they need and how you can support. So that's such great advice. And at Positive Coaching Alliance, we call them second goal parent, a parent who focuses on the second goal of sports, which is teaching the life lessons to their kids. And, you know, letting the coaches do the coaching, the players do the playing. You're there to help them connect those dots with those life lessons. Um, and I know that eSports offers so many opportunities, you know, beyond just that, um, the, the playing of the game. So what are some of those long-term, you know, college and career opportunities in eSports that parents should know about? Darrell, I'd like to address that to you first. Sure. Uh, I think I you know, lightly talked about this, right? There's, if you actually look at the NACEP ecosystem diagram, really excited about it, just because it's an easy way to kind of see, you know, the various opportunities and domains that they can go in, you know, streaming shoutcasting is one, event organizing, right, business development. Um, but even beyond that, you know, what I'm starting to see more now are programs within middle schools and high schools that are looking at CTE specifically and looking at how they can create unique career technical education pathways that align with esports, you know, and that could be uh, an entire design media arts pathway that looks at games or, you know, it could be game design. That's one avenue, but there's so many different pathways. Um, so I think CTE programs that are out there. NACEF is continuing to do work with helping support schools and developing these types of programs. Even, even looking at, you know, like, again, like these after school club environments, those are a great place to experiment and explore all of these different career opportunities. You know, and again, just have those conversations, see where their interests are. And, and I think they can really take it in whatever direction they want. You know, this is such a ripe and new field. There's new industry, new, new careers that are being shaped and created. Uh, so in a, in, a, in a sense, you know, they have an opportunity to kind of create the job that they want. Thank you for sharing that. Dr. Court, do you have anything to add um, for parents, what they should know about opportunities for kids or the future? Yeah, I mean, even if you don't go down game design, right, which seems like kind of the obvious uh, pathway, the skills and the abilities that you're learning through esports are translatable in any field, you know, teamwork, executive skills, problem solving, um, all of these sorts of things. A lot of times when we talk about video games and learning, we talk about these unintentional skills that they're learning. And research has found that they do transfer to other areas. So Larry's 11 year old learning those skills about how to lead a group of 20 year olds uh, will translate into other areas of their life. And now they've learned, oh, how to speak with authority or how to move people into groups or whatever it might be. So even if it's not game design, even if they don't go into a gaming related specific career, they are learning skills and abilities that will translate to all other areas of their life. 
Thank you. And we have a question from the audience. We'd like you to define what CTE is that you mentioned earlier, Jarrell. Sure. Career technical education. So, you know, for those of you that may have seen like ROP programs, occupational programs back in the day, it's now translated to CTE. Um, and so those are typically pathways within high schools where students can take, you know, kind of career focused tracks that allow for not just learning different areas of that particular career. So content creation could be one example, design media arts could be one example, but that also provides opportunity for you know, industry relation, relations where they can intern with a local industry partner or you know, kind of volunteer with other organizations. So again, CTE programs differ from state to state and high school to high school. So I would just look into and talk to whoever is in charge of, and then obviously reach out if you're interested in actually creating a CTE pathway. NACEF is more than happy to help support that overall development with anyone. Thank you, thank you for that. <laughs> And I can, you know, uh, share just from the Cloud9 perspective, you know, even in the short time that I've been with Cloud9, I've seen staff members come in and navigate through various roles on the team. And so just double clicking on like what it means to be a part of this industry and the opportunities that arise. You know, we have folks who do a ton of data work for us, all the analytics that come from the games and the stats and like how to really present those stats for each player in a really compelling way to help drive performance. Um, there are folks who have gone from being um, players to being streamers. So now they have their own Twitch channels or YouTube channels and are streaming their reviews of different games or just their own gameplay. Um, and bringing on guests and do, doing really original content, essentially running their own TV show on like their gaming experience. <clears throat> we even have some folks who've gone on to be uh, what are called VTubers, which they are um, animated casters. So they have animated themselves into a character and they're streaming um, their content through that animated character. Uh, C9 Vienna. So, you know, there and, and the followings are huge. Um, and so, you know, there's just so many innovative ways that are emerging to produce this content for the community, for people who are into the artistry, they're into the lore of the games, the fantasy, um, the memes, you know, people are some people are just in it for the meme. And so there's a place for you. Um, and so in the gaming world. Uh, and then, of course, there are the casters. And, you know, um, Jarell has talked a little bit about this a couple times now, but we have incredible casters and you know um, who run their own programs, talking about the games, analyzing the games, doing the live calls of the games, um, and that is an art of, in of itself that really amps up the spectator experience. Um, and so, yeah, I've seen people navigate through all of those roles on the team. Obviously, there's stuff on the business side that people have um, gotten involved with on both the marketing um, and the sort of training pieces. But um, yeah, a lot of different opportunities once you're in that ecosystem to move through different roles to, you know, live out your love for the game. Can I? Uh, to I guess pile on what Jarrell said, uh, we're at the tip of the iceberg right now for esports, and there's opportunities out there that no one even knows about. There's, um, it's all gonna, I mean, we're at the, the start of something that's gonna be huge. And so uh, curriculum development, coaching, I mean, there's like Samir and Jarrell said, there's so much out there, so much opportunity that it, it's a great time to start exploring and getting involved. Absolutely. I mean, the popularity and engagement and opportunity is growing exponentially for esports and it's not stopping, you know, so um, this both in development and competitive play and we're excited to be a part of this and make sure that this um, is a safe place and a um, fun place for you to be and learn and develop those life lessons that they're going to use beyond the playing field. Um, I do want to address mental health. This is a very important topic um, and has been you know, openly talked about more publicly lately, which is very important for youth and athletes. Um, how can parents and coaches and leaders address and help regulate mental health for young gamers, especially being in a competitive atmosphere where you might be judged by others, you feel that performance pressure. What's some advice that we can give parents and coaches to help regulate that mental health? 
feel like this is my wheelhouse. <laughs> Maybe I should start. Take it away. Um, <laughs> demystify and destigmatize the conversations is the best thing you can do. Uh, mental health is highly stigmatized um, generally, but specifically in the gaming community. And then you have the added element of stigma among professional athletes, right? You don't want to seem like a weakness. There's a thousand other people who want your spot on your team. Uh, so I think as a coach and as a parent, uh, a key critical thing you can do is just talk about it and just like it's any other part. How are you feeling? Um, I know maybe you seem stressed right now or things seem really hard right now, or you could open up these discussions and just treat it like any other part of the holistic person. You know, how is your hand feeling? How, how is your heart feeling? Uh, and having a safe space where they don't feel judged makes a world of difference. Yeah, I think the safe space piece there, you know, when I think about what makes a lot of this successful in either schools, again, and after school programs, is that culture building, ultimately, you know, as much as I, you know, I'm working with teachers and I'm helping them with curriculum, it's less about, you know, the formalized structure there and more about building the culture and community around this concept and idea. And what I've seen with that is by these role models, coaches, teachers, general managers, creating these safe spaces and embedding those positive intentions within the space, it naturally creates that support structure to help through some of the more, you know, tough times that students and youth may be going through. And I've heard stories of, you know, uh, students, uh, you know, feeling safe enough to, to let them know about their gender orientation within the space that they haven't even done with their parents yet, right? I've heard stories where uh, as part of the ritual, they journal and talk about their feelings and emotions within the club. And through that, the teacher and general manager is able to identify, you know, because it's a safe space, some of the issues that are occurring. And I mean, in general, again, it, it is a culture that we're building, whereas before the culture maybe existed external to what we're doing, we're really trying to bring that in and celebrate it and welcome it back into the space to create that safe space for them. Thank you for sharing. And I think it's really important that we break the stigma, we break the silence um, as parents, as adults, being willing to be vulnerable and share when you've made mistakes or when you are struggling, um, having those open conversations with your kids, know that you are a safe place that they can come to and talk to about these things, coaches as well. So thanks all that are tuning in. Um, and uh, if you do have any questions, please drop them in the chat box now, because we are wrapping up here pretty soon. Uh, but I did want everyone to just take a moment and share with us maybe the biggest life lesson and connection that you have seen uh, youth make from uh, esports to life after sports. So let's talk about just the biggest life lesson that you think that this experience can create for kids. It's hard to choose one, but if you can. That's a big question, Marty. <laughs> I'm going to need a minute. Or maybe the biggest one that you've learned personally that you still use today. I can say that none of my kids are after esports yet, right? They're right, still all right. totally ingrained. But uh, probably the most important thing that I think that they're learning is communication and being able to communicate with basically everyone and communicate in, in a an effective way, right? Communication is getting a message across that's heard and, and acted upon. And so they're learning uh, the right way to communicate and healthy communication and um we just continue to see that get better and better with them. So we're very happy with that. I think to, to add on to what Larry said, I think um, the biggest benefit that I see that comes out of esports that moves beyond just the straight up competition and the, and the experience itself is definitely development of healthy relationships. And maybe it's not just the healthy relationships that I think we see cultivated in classrooms every single day. It's reaching these really hard to reach kids in a lot of ways that, um, you know, for them, esports is the way to unlock an opportunity that maybe they don't have in other aspects of their life. And so to me, you know, I'm not so worried about the kids who are doing great in school and who have lots of, you know, who are, who are rock stars in all aspects of their life. I'm worried about the kids who are, you know, who are somehow isolated and who maybe don't have necessarily the great, the greatest relationships with their families or socially. And it's those kids who I have seen, you know, show up 
because they have this love for video games and it's an opportunity to do it together and form community. Like that is what I think the magic of esports is, is reaching those hardest to reach kids. And if you can give them that in a, you know, in a school environment or, you know, in a, in a club environment, that is something that they then take beyond, you know, their experience in that space. Yeah, no. I mean, oh, go ahead, Samir. I'll just say, as a parent, too, I think piggybacking on what Sue said, it's really the validation. I mean, I think, you know, there are others where because you're interested in it, you get validated really quickly and readily by your family because it's a sport that they love and maybe played themselves or enjoy watching on television. And there's great pride socially amongst other parents, too. Um, and within the family. And so to me, like esports and then esports youth programs, it's like esports youth programs have given the validation so many kids need that like this is a great way to spend my time and it's and I have value and I have a place to like express that joy and feel valued in return um, in, in ways that they may have not felt before. And so I think so there, there's going to be a generation of gamers. Like I think the folks who play pro right now or who, who are in their late 20s and 30s potentially didn't have that. Maybe they, maybe they didn't. That's why there's just so few. But like, you know, I think what I'm excited about is this current generation of gamers like Larry's kids that are coming up and have a sense of pride around this identity and feel like it is valued um, because that, that, that has been missing for a while. Yeah, I'll, I'll play off of that, you know, by having all of that support, you're really empowering them to take leadership and ownership of where they want to go. And by doing so, I feel like we're translating gamers to game changers, you know, they're really changing the dynamics, not just of, you know, their current community, but as they grow up, they do have the opportunity to change the dynamics of the esports industry as a whole, or even other industries as a whole. And it really is, again, that platform that we're providing through this. Um, and it could be anything moving forward. Maybe esports is just one thing, you know, I think there's so many other opportunities around that as well, but it's that platform that we provide for them to kind of propel uh, the growth of, um, you know, whatever it is that they want to do in their life. It's the community. If you talk about what was most important to me, it's the community. I think that Samir makes a great point too about the validation uh, that I definitely didn't have when I played games as a child. Um, and that sense of community and validation leads to you know confidence and, and all the wonderful things that Darrell was just talking about. And I don't think that value should be understated. So like, that was so well said. I love how you all just shared those positive you know, connections to life lessons here. And, you know, we're just really grateful for our partnership with Cloud9, how we've teamed up to combine that fun and excitement of gaming with positive coaching and skill building, social skill building, and core values-based um, programs that ultimately foster digital citizenship and community in this gaming culture. Um, can esports teach life lessons? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a place where kids um, from so many different ways of life, so many different backgrounds and cultures, you know, um, can find value, like Samir mentioned, and um, also understand that their value and self-worth isn't determined by their performance, right, um, throughout this gaming process. So I do, I do just want to take a moment and thank each and every one of you for your time today and for your insights. I've learned a lot from you um, of how esports uses online platforms like Discord to facilitate learning and build friendships and foster teamwork and collaboration through competitive gaming. So we really appreciate you all. Everyone that tuned in today, I really hope you enjoyed this um, conversation. Like I said, this has been recorded and you'll be able to access it uh, beyond today. And we really appreciate you for taking the time to be here. You'll see more from Positive Coaching Alliance and Cloud9 as well. You've also learned about more resources that you can tap into today through our excellent panelists. So thank you all so much for your time. Samir, did you want to say anything before we close out? No, that was perfect. Thank you, Marty, for the space. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you all. We'll see you soon. Take care. Thanks, everyone.